Welcome back everyone to Paradigm. I'm excited to say that we're already at episode four and today I'll be privileged to speak to a very special man being the president and CEO of Bankai Group, a leading international telecom investment company. He has over 35 years of experience in telecom business development. Mankim Brankhambad is here with me in the studio and he will tell me all about his inspiring journey. Now, Mankim, obviously you've made an absolute empire and I'm super excited to be speaking to you about it today. But before we get into that, tell me a little bit about who you really are deep inside, your childhood, where you started from and, and how did all these puzzle pieces, let's say, align? So I'm born and brought up in uh, Gandhinagar, uh, the capital of Gujarat, western part of India. I'm coming from a middle class, humble family. My father was officer in road and building department of a government. Nobody in my family has done business ever. And, but I was always passionate to do something new in life. And I was working with uh, a small electronic shop when in my teenage to learn the TV and fridge refrigerator repairing while I was in high school. So you've had some sort of interest. Yeah, so some sort of interest in electronics because uh, in 1980s, the electronics era was there. And then after 12th standard, I decided to uh, work with uh, a telecom company first as an apprentice. And India was migrating from a mechanical exchanges to electronic exchanges. And government was very serious about deregularizing the entire telephony over there. So I joined a company called Gujarat Communication Electronics Limited in 1985. Mm -hmm. I worked with them for four years. That was the actual learning period right. for me. So I learned how to manufacture 80 different products of a telephone. And then that company was having a collaboration with Siemens, Nitsuku, Oki Japan. In 19, and I completed my engineering degree part-time while I was working with that company for four years. In 1989, I decided to start my own business. And I signed a contract with GCL to manufacture some products in my factory mm -hmm. in 1989. So 1989 was the, the year, year when I started the business. So it was a long journey that 90, between 1989 and 98, I was in India. And 99 onwards, I I was my business into international market. Perfect. And how was that transition for you? I mean, going from an engineer to actually creating something of your own and becoming a business leader was so it difficult. What happened on those days? India was uh, there was no exchanges in rural part of India. With telephone, getting telephone connection used to take six months. So. This company, Gujarat, there was only one or two companies who used to manufacture phones. And I saw that during my job, there is a shortage of production units. And then I learned already. And then I raised the seed fund from one of the private investors. And I thought, okay, I discussed with my boss, you know, what if I start manufacturing unit? Will you help me? And he said, okay, fine. So that's the way I entered into the business. It was just the right moment. The right moment yes. in 1989. But uh, after having this three years contract with Gujarat Communication Electronics Limited, I, we entered into many other contracts for satellite receiver, dish antennas. So India was booming in migration of telephony. So 90 to 94 was a remarkable period for me because India was much regulated mm -hmm. at that time. And in 94, government deregulated and then they released the private action licenses in western part of India. So I have took 70 licenses in western part of India right. to give a telephone connection uh, to home and offices. Right. And that was kind of the moment when yeah, that things was are the, growing. Yeah, that was the moment... Uh, it, so it was still a learning moment for me because I was knowing how to execute and deliver the products. But, right. But the, lately I realized, hey, you know, the business is different than delivering just a product. Right, of course. So those six years are like my executive MBA. Right. And in 1994, I, I was the guy who installed first private exchange of India. I was hoping to become Insane. a mobile operator, but they, they, they released the licenses in 95. But I missed the bus because I was not having a resource of ra raising funds for the business. 
uh, although I was capable to do that business. Is it something But, you regret now thinking about it? No, not today. Okay. Uh, I regret it for four or five years. And then you let it go. But then I moved to international market in 1999. I'm fine with it. It was actually happened in my favor. Uh, if I took license in 94, I would never move to U.S. Right. And then never reach to 200 countries where we are today. Right. So let me tell you the journey after that. So between 94 and 99, we ran 70 private exchanges. I was having a manufacturing unit and we were also having a marketing division where we used to do provide office automation products starting from copier to fax machine. And I was having more than 5,000 customers in Western part of India. But in 1999, I come across... Uh, I was thinking, you know, the margins were shrinking because we have seen a great margin during uh, 89 and 95. Right. 95 onwards, margins were shrinking. So I decided to cash out the businesses. So I sold my 70 exchanges, manufacturing unit also I sold, and then I cashed out. Interesting and, move. And that was one year vacation I have taken in my life. So 1999 was a time when I took a vacation. <laughs> Did you to, know what to do with yourself or was it no, weird? No, <laughs> so I wanted to do research of an international market. All right, what is so happening, you had a goal. Yeah, what is happening in the new technologies in the market. So I visited many events in like Computex Taiwan and then Singapore, many telecom events. And I come across with one of the big carrier of the US. So wipe technology was emerging technology on those days. Because earlier the international call was happening through satellite uh, and then lately after dot-com era and the fiber, submarine fiber era, the wipe technology emerged and then there was a war between TDM technology and a voice over internet protocol. So uh, all the carriers, telecom carriers were mostly sitting in the U.S., There were top 10 carriers were there, and then one of them wanted to outsource their billing software development in India. So the CEO talked to me, and then he said, hey, you know, can you help us developing a billing software? So we took that RFP. I hired a few developers, and then we successfully developed that software for them. Because I, I'm coming from a telecom, and then I had right. all the domain knowledge of the uh, telecom. It was your world fully. Yeah, it was my world. So... So I was not knowing exactly how the VoIP international calling and SMS business goes because my experience was more mainly on a domestic uh, telephony for, of India, but not international. But then this company told us, hey, you know, can you provide us technology plus back office services for our business uh, we are doing? So yes, we provided them billing software and we hired roughly 100 people in India and then we used to monitor how their business is mm -hmm. going on. Mm -hmm. So then I realized, hey, you know, these guys are between two operators. They collect the call and uh, messages from one operator and then deliver to other operators. That is what is a carrier business. So we provided the services for two, three years and then this company was working between US and Latin America mainly and they were having roughly $100 million in revenue at that time. And, but they wanted to expand the relationship uh, in Africa, Middle East, and Asia. So I told them, you know, I have uh, connections on those countries because I was manufacturing the exchanges, so I know all the operators over there. So why don't we do something together? So we formed an SPV in Mauritius in 2003. And then we used to sign a contract with operators in Africa, Middle East, and Asia. It was a tripartite contract. The U.S. company was having a license. We were acting as an agent. And then other side, we were also technology provider. So we right. helped them grow from $100 million revenue, and they raised to $300 million in two and a half years. It's more than double. Yeah. So in 2005, 2006, uh, somebody, some European operator came to acquire us. But I denied to get acquired. Uh, I, we just transferred the asset. It's very normal, though. Yeah, it's not normal. But, but you know, I, I would 
I would like, I wanted to just go full fledged in that area. So that was another turning point of my life. 2005, I decided to, because I, were, I was partially moving between US and India, and I moved to US. We took license in US, and now we are connected with roughly 200 operators through submarine cable. Uh, we are connected with 2,000 carriers globally. We are performing 16 billion voice minutes, billions of SMS. Crazy. Data business and performing $2.5 billion revenue. And talking about these facts, I mean, I have a few notes here that Bankai Group has achieved significant milestones such as commissioning India's first private group telephone exchange. Mm -hmm. Can you share some other key moments, obviously, or achievements that really stand out in your journey? So what happened, uh, India was like a department of telecom earlier, and then they wanted, they formed a tri, uh, Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, because they wanted, the government wanted to privatize, but before that they wanted to form a research group uh, in India. So I was part of that research group. Uh, uh, appointed by my company where I was working. So we always discuss one thing, you know, what is the problem in India? Why we are not able to provide a telephone connection fast? Right. So the problem was a last mile. So cable comes till the crossroad of nearby your home, but there was no one who can carry the cable from that junction box to the house. To the house. Mm -hmm. So they came out with an idea. So if somebody put an exchange, a small exchange there, and that private company can provide that connectivity. Right. And then department was ready to share the revenue with them. So they came out with the license. So that was a moment for me to get into that license. Uh, and, and I was knowing that there will be some, because GSM was, GSM technology was developed by Europe. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was uh, predictable in few years there will be mobile phone in India. Right. So I was aiming to become an operator. Right. And take that train before anybody yeah. else does. But tell me, was the government in India supportive of all of these initiatives that you've done? Not really. I can uh, imagine, At that yes. time, it was very tough for me to get when I, when I launched the exchange. Just take a permission to road cross the cable for cabling. Everything took a yeah, lifetime, it probably. Three, it takes three months. Yeah. It took three years to install one exchange for me. Right. Now, how would you say you kind of stay ahead of the game? Because obviously your industry is extremely ever-evolving. So what I observed earlier, if you see the in era of 90, the people who has money and uh, connect connections, they used to, they, they were able to uh, establish a business. But then over a period of time, faster can eat slower, bigger cannot eat smaller. That's what I observed. So you have to be fast in the game and then you should be very focused in the industry. Mm -hmm. So that's why I focus on only telecom for first 35 years. Since last eight years, I'm a little bit diverting. I started diversification after 2009 into fintech, right. AI, right. blockchain and all. And you're going to tell me all about that up next. Yeah, so so uh, just remain focused and, and you, you will always be able, able to see that what is new coming and you have to keep learning and investing in right. your time and money on that. Right. Now tell me a little bit about fintech since you have been expanding into that into that yeah. area. How's that going for yeah, you? Yeah, so what happened when we started... Uh, uh, the business, uh, license business, because earlier between 2000 and 2003, we had a good big partner in the U.S. But in 2005, it was again a restart because we took a license in U.S., Bankai took a license in U.S., and then uh, we started from scratch because those old assets which we built with that partner, we sold that to mm -hmm. a European operator. So how to start now? Because which first operator will, you know, do business with us? Right. So we focused on East Africa. So we opened an office in East Africa, connected. We established a network relationship with the East African operator, Safaricom and uh, others. And then at that time, Safaricom launched the M-Pesa. Okay. Correct. And then uh, because I'm coming from a technology background, when we started this voice business, 
all other carriers were using third-party billing and switching solution. We develop our own switching solutions. That was the age for us because mm -hmm. we had no switching cost, no technology cost because we develop our own technology. We also develop a calling card platform, service delivery platform, and a mobile top-up platform. Now, when I'm talking about mobile top-up, it is a use case of uh, value transfer because when I'm topping up your mobile through some application, I'm transferring a value to your mobile, right? It's the right. same like you're transferring money. Right. So when we observe <coughs> Safaricom's success between 2007 and 2009, I said, hey, this is a fantastic. So telecom goes with a banking. The future digital banking is already started. Right. So let us start investing into that. And then we hired a technical team in California and India, and we started our research in 2008-9. And we came out with the first version of a MobiFin, mobile MobiFin technology, mm -hmm. which sits between the core banking solution and the subscriber, because the old, uh, the legacy CBS doesn't allow access to the subscriber easily, because mm -hmm. if you want to do internet banking, you have to have a lot of securities there, Of right? course. While in mobile money, people would like to just transfer money on the fingertip. So that's what we observed, and then uh, we develop a great technology for that. Right, perfect. But what would you believe are going to be the most significant, let's say, technological advancements in the next couple of decades? Technological advancement in telecom and fintech, let me give you my both the perspective. So in telecom, uh, you know, there was a 2G, 3G, 4G, and now it is a private 5G. So right. Right the, now the 5G. Yeah, <laughs> the 5G. So 5G is a low terrestrial, and then 6G is a high terrestrial. So these are two technologies. But so 5G and 6G onwards, what we see is earlier, the, you know, just talking on phone was innovation, mm -hmm. right? But now that is a necessity. The data is a necessity. So connectivity should not be a problem. Now, what after the connectivity is the digital transactions, financial transactions, social media. So all data and financial transactions are going to be important. And then now it is having this data, now AI, ML, and blockchain. So everything should be secure because they no were concerned about the security earlier. Right. Now blockchain is a technology. So Bankai is focusing on these uh, all these areas uh, moving forward. Perfect. Now, this is kind of a bit off topic, but since you did mention 5G and 6G, what do you believe there is any sort of you know health concerns that we should have? Because it's a topic that's been going on around for ages, whether or not 5G so, is so, radioactive for you, whether it's not. So 5G mainstream, uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, discussion around that. Yeah. But I don't think uh, uh, there should be any problem to the human life, especially the topics are happening over there, you know, if there is a 5G. So uh, your question is about the human life or just Exactly, technology? the concerns that we have with our own health if we have systems. Yeah, so that is, see, that is obvious. Even this light is harming to the life, right? Because if you talk about science, any doctor can answer that better. Mm -hmm. But in my view, the any radio we are using has it, its it, effect. It, it, it's a harmful. Yeah. So you have to just use it for the necessity, not for the entertainment. Always. That's what. Very interesting. Is, yeah. I'll pass that on to my kids one day. Yeah. <laughs> right now, moving on. Um, in light of the, let's say, increasing concerns that we have with with data privacy, with security. I wanted to ask you, how does Bankai Group really address these issues when it comes to, you know, protecting your own data, so, especially now that you've entered, you know, fintech and, and, and yeah, so the money world? We follow the GDPR laws and uh, we constantly evolve by having our own IT team. At the same time, we get regular audit uh, for various audits requirement are there in the telecom because we have our co-locations in different parts of the world, the US, Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, Europe. So it has to be audited periodic periodically. And then we use a uh, lot of encrypted services, encrypted uh, data. Uh, we follow all the compliances right. required by the regulations. Perfect. Now moving on to some more, let's say casual questions. I wanted to ask you, what does Bankai mean? 
How did the word Bankai so, Group come what from? happened, like my stepping stone company name was Panamax. Okay. And it is still there. So the technologies we build, we sell under Panamax. That is a company in India. And then uh, we entered into an international market. Uh, we were thinking, you know, there has to be some different name. So my name is Bankim. And uh, it was discussion between me, my wife, and my sister. <laughs> you know, so she said... Hey, Family decision. My, my say, wife said, why don't Bankai? I said, okay. Sounds, so that is... <laughs> nice on the tongue, yes. Yeah. Perfect. Now, how would you describe your leadership style? If you could. So leaders, so uh, when when I started uh, building a team in India, it was tough time because I wouldn't I was not experienced to have international resources, and then my English was also not that good because I did my I did business in western part of India, especially Gujarat. So Gujaratis normally their English English is not that good. All right. So, because we do business in domestic style. So rather than hiring too many experts. I was expert in telephone, telephony already. So we, I hired a fresh graduates, 50 graduates, and then we built the team in India, the core team. So right now we have a 1,500 people sitting in India and then 500 people in different par part of the world. Uh, we have a thir 37 chief growth officers. They are equally experienced like me. So togetherness is the one word where right. you have to constantly keep working as a team and value everyone's opinion. That right. is what is the uh, training uh, and constant research and togetherness and brainstorming right. and inclusive decisions. Definitely. Now, as the president and CEO, how does your day look like? Oh, my day look like it's because it's a global... Uh, I have a habit to sleep at 2 2 a.m. 2 a.m. Oh, wow. And wake up at 8.30. All right. Have some light exercise, not that much. Okay. Some yoga, uh, only a breathing exercise. And then from 10 to night 10, I work at office. Okay. 10 o'clock, I come at home. You travel often? Yeah, I travel. I used to travel 150 days in a year. Uh, oh, now no. Now I reduce to 70. It's like a third? Yeah, because... Uh, to establish relationship with the operator, one operator takes five to six months. And they would like to see the face of the top leader because right. it's it's not that easy to get uh, connected with one operator for this because w uh, this carrier business is a recurring business. It's not just you're buying and selling one time. It is constant, everyday business, right? So, so let me explain you how it works. Like when you call from... Your, uh, if you are a subscriber of AT&T, and right. if you're calling to a Tisalat subscriber, uh, both the operators need carrier between them to carry that call. So to establish that relation is not just a commercial relation, but also technically you have to connect the switches both the side. I see. So that's why you have to keep traveling. Interesting. Now, next question that I have for you is actually questions from the audience. We have did place a survey online, and we got the three top questions okay. that the audience would like to find out from you. So the first question goes, Hello, my name is Anoop. Are there any books, podcasts, or other resources that you found practically inspiring or useful in your professional journey? Uh, I was, uh, so I would like to answer Anoop. Thank you for uh, asking this question. Uh, I was mostly inspired by the Germans who used to come to my uh, Gujarat Communication Electronics Limited when I was working, and then Japanese people and Mr. Sam Pitroda, uh, who was the inventor for C dot technology. So that was my first inspiration. And then after that, when while during the experience, getting gaining experience of a business, I used to just keep doing my own research and talking to my colleagues, competitors, and then you get self-inspired. Right. So there's not one specific. No, not one specific book or podcast. No, no, no. All right, Anup. Hopefully that answers your question. Moving on to Muhammad, can you share a memorable moment or funny story from your career that has stuck with you over the years? 
No, so the funny story was uh, in 1999, why I decided to uh, stop doing business in India. So that was a funny story. We're ready for it. <laughs> yeah, so, so I was also providing, I was taking government contract in India. And one of the officer wanted to take advantage of for, against the giving the contract to me and then I was not ready to give that bribe and that created a big chaos my payment was stuck in the government and then I, I approached uh, the industry ministry uh, of Gujarat but that minister helped me a lot and then he shouted you know he just fired that guy government guy and mm -hmm. that that moment was very funny because the press reporters came and on that day night I decided oh it you know it sounds I don't horrible though it doesn't sound yeah, funny. Yeah, so so oh my God. in the evening I decided hey you know I don't want to do business here uh, I was a little frustrated because how can I become a big if the environment is like that you know sometimes moments in life like they happen for a reason you know, yeah. sometimes certain things happen. In that moment, it seems like it's the end of the world, but it takes us to the other side of the world where, you know, God gave us a better path. Yeah. So you should always have faith. Absolutely. I mean. I'm thankful to that guy. He <laughs> frustrated me at that time. So I, but I, I was eyeing on international market, but I was not getting. So that one year of taking vacation was tough for me because I was having 200 people working, making good EBITDA, manufacturing unit and selling all the exchanges in and you're workaholic you're yeah, used so, to it right yeah it's... so my wife was not happy with that with season. you being home <laughs> yeah you know because she said hey you know why you want to sell everything and, and you know i said i don't want to do any business right now in trust India. me i would like to do something different right and i mean it turned out to be yeah. the best possible thing now, Mohammed, hopefully that answers your question. I think there's a bigger message actually behind this funny story because obviously things happen for a reason. And yeah. even if it seems like the worst possible thing in that moment, just believe that there's something better coming. Now, Rajesh, last but not least, what advice would you give to young professionals who are just starting their careers in the telecom industry? So you need to understand at what time you are entering into the telecom industry because telecom industry is not the same every day. Today, In today's world, every industry is, is not the same every day. So unless you don't have a right knowledge for that industry and if you don't have a right study for that, just for a trade, a small trade, if you know the trade, you don't enter into the business. You should have a complete knowledge about the industry. And then you have to have a financial knowledge also. Because I suffered a lot not having a financial knowledge initially. But now in this era, I think, you know, the startup culture is different. And then there are a lot of VCs who support the startup. In those days, in 90s, there was no VCs for us, right? So of course. that's the message. You, you didn't have anyone to pitch to because there was nobody there to listen to you. Yeah. It's either you start with your own five coins that exactly. you have in your pocket so, or so it's, work for someone else. There is no entry barrier nowadays. Right. But, uh, in 90s, if you see, there was an entry barrier to raise even $100,000. And I mean, today, I feel like there's just uh, bigger opportunities out there. If you want to start a company, you have Canva. You know, you have some other tools. You have ChatGPT. Right. You can just plug it all in and, and without investing one penny... Uh, you can kick it off and then with time, obviously, ask for investors, ask for, you know, some money and see where it goes. So I will take two minutes of yours to of explain uh, what approach I have taken to reach here. So I spent building a telephone, telephony business, means in a career business between 2005 and 2015. So... There was a limited working capital with me. If you see uh, for telephone business, this carrier business requires a lot of working capital because if I want to send traffic to Etisalat, Etisalat will not give me credit mm -hmm. generally, right? So we build the credit worth $50 million from operators in 10 years. And we used to perform $350 million revenue till 2015. 
an entire industry was working like that. Operator gives credit, you rotate that working capital for 10 times, 5 times in a year, and then with a thin margin, you were doing business. In 2015, I decided, hey, you know, why should I run my business with the operator's money? Instead, let me go in the market and raise fund. So that was another turning point for me. Meanwhile, our fintech platform was evolved uh, in the market and we had a 45 customers. And my daughter entered into the game because Perfect. she was studying uh, in the fintech. So between in 2016, we converted our carrier business into more telecom business plus financing business. So we started financing the working capital of the partners. So right now, we raise roughly $500 million. Uh, like suppose if I, AT&T send me traffic, we do the, take the insurance against that, raise fund, and rotate that money 10 times. $500 million. $500 million, slowly. Not bad. Starting from <laughs> $50 million, Today we have a $500 million fund, excess of $500 million. So we that's what we invest in the network of the operators. And we become a $2.2 billion company now. So Insane. in the last eight years, I've, I've become more investors in a way rather than just doing a telecom business. Right. And then in 2016, we started a receivable finance company called Carriox Capital. And in last three years, a lot of mergers and acquisitions we have done on a blockchain and fintech. So we, are, we acquired one company uh, called Acute Informatics in India. They have 112 customers using their software in the bank. And our MobiFin technology is a fintech technology plus one blockchain-based Australian company we acquired. And now we are coming out with a fintech token. So we already launched a fintech token. My son is a CEO of that uh, business. Me and him had a so, lovely conversation yeah, during so token. Yes. It's an ecosystem we are trying to build. And so we also acquired one AI ML company. So Bankai Lab is all about AI ML. So if you see in future, Bankai would like to become investor with having right. a technology platforms and would like to help uh, the youngsters or startup companies. Listen, I think it's so great that you, you're you so agile, you're so adaptable, and you're modernizing with time. Otherwise, you know, you would have ended up just like Nokia did, right? Where they had their 20 years of fame and then they didn't continue their journey and evolving into what this generation wants and needs now. So it's great to hear that you're actually focusing on what's going to happen in the next 20, 30 years and where are you going to be in that, you know? So at the end of the day, yeah, it's a shifting paradigm, right? So I, I have never thought... Uh, in our vision and mission statement, it is always about innovation and research, mergers and acquisitions. We never think about just become a $10 billion company or a $100 billion company. That is a byproduct. You know, the, right. the worth is a byproduct if you have a good people on board, uh, good human resources and partners. Of course. Bankim, it was an absolute pleasure speaking to you today. Thank you. Thank you for all of your wisdom and your knowledge. Thank and you. thank you for flying in all the way from New York. And we hope to see you again very soon. Sure. Uh, especially at the Leaders in Fintech Awards coming up in September. Pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for joining us on this insightful episode of Paradigm. We hope you enjoyed our conversation with Ban Kim, whose journey, I have to say, from a telecom engineer to the CEO of Bankai Group is truly inspiring. We at Entrepreneur Middle East are always grateful for such opportunities to hear about the future direction of the telecom sector. Stay tuned for more thought-provoking discussions and inspiring stories in our next episode of Paradigm. Like, share, and comment your thoughts on the episode. And stay tuned to Entrepreneur TV Middle East for more inspiring stories. Until then, you know the drill. Keep innovating, keep evolving, and keep reshaping the future. With you, Luzmina Vucic.